Well, hi there, this is John with uh, part two of the free consultation. I'm not gonna, I'm, I hope I'm not gonna repeat myself too much, but I wanted to continue because there's some important things that I did not get to in the last uh, segment. So this is part two and just keep in mind that a lot of the things I do, my concern is that um, a person is going to be able to manage property rights and investment, a business income, something like that, in a way that where he can effectively manage risk and avoid the cost of litigation, number one, and then really avoid pretty much any risk that he doesn't voluntarily get into. For example, you can voluntarily get into a risk by being the personal guarantor on a lease agreement, okay, commercial lease agreement. So that's okay in a temporary term, but um, generally my focus is on avoiding risk and taxes are the least risk in my opinion. You can actually do not so smart things and end up paying a little more taxes and that's okay in my opinion. Um, but managing other risk, for example, if I'm gonna do something to avoid a tax, but it's gonna mean I'm gonna miss opportunity, well then that's the bigger risk because if I can take my property or my money and go and make some more money with it and get a good return on my money, well then isn't that better than having to deal with taxes or first. I mean, I, my concern is making more money and let's call it net present value, return on capital, internal rate of return. I want that to be my focus. I want to make money with my capital. I want it to work for me. And yeah, if I can get a tax benefit, I'm not going to ignore that, but I'm not going to steer my whole operation, my whole plan for a tax benefit. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to finish last if I do that. And that's what I've seen over the years anyway. So the next concept that I mentioned in the in segment one has to do with uh, the charging order. Okay, now this term charging order has to do with a writ or judgment from a court. That's what charging order means. It's a writ from a judge. Let's call it a writ of attachment. Another complicated term for taking people's stuff, okay? The nice thing about limited liability companies is it's built into the statutory framework. So if your country like in the United States, recognizes a limited liability company, it's that much nicer because not only do you have a, a great legal defense if you set it up properly, but a creditor who tries to get a writ of attachment for your individual personal interest in a, court, in a limited liability company, not just a corporation, but a limited liability company where there are other members is penalized if he gets a writ of attachment, let's say it's for a judgment of a million dollars, okay? And then he gets the judge to agree that the creditor can attach your interest in the company. And then because of the nature of the limited liability company in the States, the charging order protection would preclude the creditor from actually getting the money, even if he got a permission from the judge. And if that were the case, let's say he got a writ for a million dollars for his client who sued you personally, and he did not collect on the million dollars. His client would owe taxes on the million dollars because he didn't collect on it. Now, if he collected on part of it, he would owe taxes on whatever amount he did not collect on. So right there, that's gonna avoid cost of litigation. They're just not gonna do it. They're not going to bring a client into a situation where they have to go back to the client a year later and say, oh, sorry, um, we got a writ of attachment. Yeah, we won the case, but we couldn't get any money uh, for whatever reason, uh, charging order protection. And so therefore, um, you got to pay tax on the amount we did not collect. And do you think that attorney is going to really survive professionally, right? He's going to have problems down the road getting new business. So they're not going to do it. So that's why I like using public records and I can show the ownership the way I want. And some states don't, it doesn't, the, the states don't even show the exact ownership that I would prefer to show. So in those states where it's needed, I don't do it all the time, but I even will upload additional information about the articles that's not normally published. That way, if someone later on, a creditor 10 years from now or whatever, wants to go look, he's going to pull that document and, and he's going to see what I want him to see, that it's not going to be financially effective for him to try to take, use the court to try to take some property. So it's really powerful to have charging under protection. And here's how you get it you have to have at least two or more interests in the limited liability company in the articles. So that means there has to be two members with an ownership interest. And it cannot be a husband and wife. It has to be, um, it could be, uh, you know, business partners. It could be a mom and a, it could be a mom and a son, a dad and a daughter. It could be anything like that. Um, as long as there's two or more owners, 
it doesn't matter the percentage. Now, sometimes in a, an LLC, um, you can have two real business partners that actually really have a, an agreement and they're working on a project to make money <clears throat> and they're going to take their profits later. Uh, or you can just be by yourself. A lot of people are by themselves. They're an entrepreneur and they don't really have a business partner. They have like two employees, but they don't want to make them partners. So in that case, if you want to use the two member LLC, you literally can add Uncle Bob. Okay, and make sure it's a real person. That's what I like to do. I don't like to use in that case a fictitious name. I like to use a real person that has, you know, he could have a right, but if I name Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob gets nothing just because I named him in my articles and he appears on the county uh, records, on the state records. And out of courtesy, I would ask my Uncle Bob if that's okay if I add his name and he's gonna say, oh, okay, well, uh, yeah, I guess you could add my name to your company. Uh, do I get any money from that? And I would say no. <laughs> And then uh, he would say, well, do I have any taxes in that situation? And of course, you wouldn't have any tax liability either, just because your name is included on the LLC. Now, that's a cheap way to do it. Okay, so you can do it that way. I like a little more sophisticated way of doing it because it plays into the longer term plan of what someone that comes to me for help would want to do later on. So the, the beginning stages are going to solve the, the problem or uh, meet the needs of what you asked me to do, but I'm going to give you something a little bit more so that you can build it out later, let's say. And you can always change the membership in a limited liability company. You just amend the articles. Uh, I like to start them out with an unincorporated association, but sometimes I will start them out with two members. So it depends on your individual situation. Um, here, let me give an example of why this works. And people ask me all the time, well, how are you able to like take money from a merchant processor. Let's say I'm um, a professional office, like a chiropractor. And I have so much, so many patients and so much income and it's coming from insurance companies and merchant processors. And I'm an S corp. I'm filing as an S corp every year. Now keep in mind an S corp is a tax treatment. It's an accounting practice. Okay. So what I would do is set up another company if I'm going to try and eliminate some, some type of risk and I'm going to have a different tax treatment. And then I'm going to move all the business S corp income, I'm going to move it over to this new limited liability company. Now, what I'm doing by that is I'm creating an innocent party. I'm creating a, a recipient of all the income that has a completely different tax treatment than my S corp. The reason why I do that is because I don't want to change what an S corp is doing. I don't want to have a conversation with the accountant. He doesn't need to know me. All he needs to know is everything is the same. But by me setting up a separate company and handling all the income before it goes to the S corp, a middleman, so to speak, I can then decide how much money I can pay the S Corp and I can decide when. So I could turn it off. I could turn it on. That way, if something is levying my business income, like the IRS, for example, the tax people, um, or if there's a judgment lien that's being collected against my receivables, let's call that a till take, right? This is where someone's taking your your receivables as they come in the door before you actually put your hands on it, they're grabbing it for because of a court order. So if I set up your income through to flow through another innocent party, well, that innocent party has done nothing. It doesn't have judgments against it. it it's not, it doesn't have a tax liability. So, so how can I do that? Well, like we've discussed previously in part one, it's because of the tax treatment. So I can pool the money over there, but here's the real concept that I want to share with you. Let's, let's, let's imagine that you're watching this video. And of course, I don't know you typically, you don't know me really. You might know my name. You don't really know me. We're strangers. So if you and I, we have no, have never had any business together. So if you and I happen to meet together and we decide that we're going to, something sounds like a good idea and we're going to put some cash into a deal, right? So let's say you and I put equal amounts of cash into a deal. And then because we're so smart, we made 10 times our money in a year. Now, yeah, that's taxable, right? It's reportable, but to whom? We put our money into a deal. That's not taxable. We made 10 times our money. We made 10 times our money. Not me, you and I together. You and I together have never filed a tax return. We've never told anyone we're a partnership. We didn't even choose a tax treatment. We don't have any, together we have no tax liability. I might have a tax liability because I've filed returns before. You might have a tax liability because maybe you have all kinds of debt, who knows? But your interest in our partnership together has never been treated with any tax rules or conditions or criteria. We've never, in this hypothetical example, we may have never 
uh, incurred an obligation together. Maybe you have a contract with people that you owe money to, and maybe I have a contract that I owe money to people, but together, nope, we together, the thing that we did together has no liability. So that 10 times our money comes back. So we put in $100,000, we get a million dollars back. And so that million dollars is now sitting on the table, let's just say, we're all done. Yay, we got 10 times our money. So now, when I take my share out, it's a different world. When I take my share, whatever liabilities attached to me, that's on me. Same for you. That's why we can do it this way because, and we can do this without a limited liability company, we can do it with a partnership, we can do it with a handshake. If you understand what's going on, the law recognizes this. The law recognizes what an innocent party is. I'm not just saying there's a law about innocent parties. I'm just saying this is a legal concept that everybody understands. This is where we get into, um, you guys know this, if you put property rights into a trust, right? So you take the property rights out of your name and the trust protects the property rights so that your liability is no longer attached to that property. Well, what's the trust? It's an innocent party. No one's ever said that to you before, probably. So that's an example of why this works so effectively. This is my response to accountants who say, how can you have a limited liability company that doesn't file a tax return? Well, here's why. Because it never filed a tax return. Now, the day it does, yeah, you better keep filing it until you dissolve it. That's how it works. The fact that you have an S-Corp and it's filing a return, I mean, the fact that it's an S-Corp tells me you're filing a return because you can't, you can't have an S-Corp until you file a return. You have to tell the IRS in the States that that's how it is. So um, I want to address the list of states that I prefer. Now, the, the way I pick a state where you register this, and I think, by the way, I think this is going to change. I think um, registering your organization with a state or a government organization, province, whatever, is just because that's what the banks require to, in order to deal with the money system, to get into the banking system, to have an account, the banks require you to register your uh, company with the state. All that means is you're publishing its existence with the state. And when you pay your filing fee with the state, what you're doing is paying for what's called indemnification. That is the purpose of a filing fee. That's the purpose of filing with the state. The state is indemnifying the individual owners, if it's structured properly, against liabilities other than what the company incurs for itself. It's not gonna protect the company per se, but it's gonna protect the investors and the owners of the company. That is what registering a company is doing. Now, I believe that this year, we're gonna start seeing companies registered on a blockchain without registering with the state, never opening a bank account, never getting a tax number, and operating just like they would do today, except their banking facility is a smart contract or a collection of smart contracts or its own server. That's happening. So it's going to be kind of interesting. But for right now, I'm just going to review this with you. Um, the best states I like in the United States would be the states that don't interfere with your company. When you register the company, the state just ignores you. It doesn't send you letters demanding you fill out more forms. It doesn't accuse you of having employees and not paying taxes and paying wages and all this other nonsense that sometimes just requires you to send a letter back saying we don't have employees. Okay, It's just a nuisance. So to avoid all that, the states that are the best, in my opinion, are Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Georgia. And I, I'm, not, I'm not excluding certain states because they have a problem. I'm just saying we don't really think about them too much, like Idaho and Utah. Those are good states, too. I just don't use them very much. Um, North Carolina is a good state. Mississippi is a good state. South Carolina is a good state. I avoid the following states. And I know some of the states I just mentioned probably have some solvency problems. But the, where it's a big problem that I've seen for people is in the state of California, because primarily because of the California Franchise Tax Board. So if, you're, if you reside in California and you want to set up a company or you have a company in California, you want, to, you want to move your company or change its situs out of the state of California. Now, you can stay in California. Your company can be out of California. But if you don't register the company correctly, the state will tell on you. The state will tell the state of California that someone who resides in California is using a foreign company. And so the state of California Franchise Tax Board will send you a bill for not filing in the state of California. And the bill is your, your typical $800 filing fee, which is ridiculous, okay? So there is a bit of a trick if you're in California to not deal with the state. I recommend never registering in the state of California, registering your company. 
And I hope some of you people from California that you work in the government that you hear this because y'all cause this problem by the way you treat people. I know people would tolerate you if you charged a reasonable amount of money and you were fair with them. But when you cheat them and trick them and you're just a tyrant, well, then they're just going to move away from you. And, and they should. So the states I avoid are California, Texas, because Texas, why pay $300 a year and then deal with all that documentation and they wanted you to follow these things and they harass you for that. Um, Illinois, same thing. Okay. Illinois, California, they're bankrupt. <clears throat> so because they're bankrupt, they, uh, they have a tendency to tax you, nickel and dime you for every little thing. Okay. Same with New York. I stay away from New York because part of the problem is a lot of people want to uh, invest in cryptos these days. And if you show any New York residency, then you'll have You'll, you'll be denied access to certain coins and, and platforms. So it's bad enough that you have a New York ID. So if you're in New York, we register the company in Pennsylvania or Ohio. We could do it in New Mexico too, but we just pick one of those states. The reason why I like Pennsylvania, Arizona, and New Mexico is because there are no annual fees and you don't file an annual report. That's another criteria that I use for choosing a state in which to register my LLC. Um, but yeah, if you're in New York, we organize in another state, then we also get you an ID that you can use for banking purposes that doesn't identify you as a New York resident. So that is something else that's a little bit additional service. So let me know if you're in that situation. There are ways around that, but anyways, there are, there are things we can do. So for the vast majority, we have Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Georgia. Those are good states. North Carolina is a good state. Um, I, you know, th those I didn't mention, they're probably good states too, but stay away from California, Texas, Illinois, New York. What was the other one? Probably, I think it's either up in the Northeast, probably Rhode Island. I can't remember. It was a $500 filing fee. If you see that, I would, there's no need to register like that. $500 is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, there's that. Now, Wyoming, people want to, people are sold on Wyoming just like 10 years ago and 20 years ago, they were really sold on Nevada. Nevada's fine. Uh, Nevada is just really a brand name. You're going to get the same protection with an LLC in the States, in any of the States. So it comes down to what's a better state that you don't have to deal with too much. Well, pick a state that doesn't require an annual report and a filing fee, and maybe you don't care about that. Okay. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, so for Wyoming, it has legislation that actually makes it to where Anyone holding cryptographic currency has clear title to it, let's say, clear title. There's not real title to it, but has clear title so that within, after two years of holding coins as a resident of the state of Wyoming, whether it's your LLC or you individually, no one can sue you and say those coins are from ill-gotten gains. No one accuse, can accuse you of money laundering. By state law, it cleans the title to that money, so it avoids that situation. That's kind of cool, but... Because I, the way I write these contracts, you can get those same benefits in any state because of the way I've written the contract and because of the understanding that you have for how I set this up. So Wyoming is kind of nice. It creates a safe haven. But again, it may require litigation to get those benefits. I like to get those benefits without litigation. I like to do that in the contract. All right. So, yeah. So we mentioned some, the states that we want to avoid, the states that um, are preferred. Um, the other thing is when you register in a state, you're required by law, this, the company is, to have what's known as a registered agent or a statutory agent. This is an agent, it's a, an agent for the company that is a third party. All it does is receive process. What that means is there has to be a person who can accept a summons and a complaint or an official process from a government agency legally and be, make the company legally bound to respond and thereby create a default or an answer time or something like that. So there has to be a designated office or individual. It could be you at your home, or it could be a professional service at an office where that service is an agent for thousands of other companies. You could do it that way. Now, typically the fees for that are, sometimes you can find a registered agent fee for, for free for the first year, or you can uh, pay $100 or $150 a year. You can even pay more if there are other services. Those are kind of nice if you want to pay for that. You don't have to do that. What I like to do is set up a registered agent in a way that meets the criteria, but doesn't cost any money. So that's one of the selling points, I think, of what I set up. So basically, you can actually get a company set up through my service and have no 
annual fees, no regular fees for years down the road forever, if you want. It's not necessary, but it's one of the things I like to be able to do. Um, as far as naming the companies, I like to pick a simple name. I avoid using your complete legal name in the company. You don't have to. Um, some people like to use their last name and then put the word investment group after it, like Smith Investment Group. Um, I recommend using a, a proper noun or a noun and then some other designation like, like uh, Florida. I mean, you could use you can use the state name if you want. Florida um, hockey team. I mean, I'm just making you know hockey teams in Florida don't really exist that well. I'm just saying um, it can be anything. It can be a stupid name. It can be a series of letters. Just keep in mind that um, you can misspell the deliberately misspell the words. Just keep in mind that when you tell people the name of your company. You probably want to do it so it's an easy way so you don't have to keep repeating the name and spell it out for somebody maybe you want to keep it simple if that's how you're going to use the company if you're not well then it doesn't really matter you can call it whatever you want and you can always if you don't like the name or you want to change it later you can change the name or you can operate through a fictitious name with the same name that you already had so you can actually open a bank account and do business under a fictitious name even though the company name has something else so company name is not a big deal um, i like to keep it simple you know, you can't, there are some statutory limitations. You can't use the word mortgage or trust or bank in the name of your LLC or corporation, unless you have a banking license or a financial license of some kind. So there's a few limitations. Um, okay, and the other thing is, now this may, this is gonna lead into what I'm gonna tell you right now, will lead into the tutorial videos that I have in the membership area. But let's say I'm talking to somebody that has eight different residential, real estate investments where those properties are generating rental income. And sometimes people will set up a limited liability company for each of those properties. You can do that. It can be expensive and or it can be unnecessary. So a person who does that would have a different company and pay an annual fee. And then sometimes they'll even have accounting and they'll be filing tax returns on that one investment when really you're not really avoiding risk when you could when all those residential real estate, single family residential, let's say, those are all, let's say in the same town and the risk is very, very similar. Why not have one LLC own all the titles and then just have an, another LLC in the background that's receiving all the cash flow? You can, you can have one LLC that's managing all the cash flow from all kinds of things, right? So if you understand that concept, think about this. I can have one LLC own lots of different parcels of real estate if the risk is similar. Like I wouldn't have 12, single family residentials paying me rent and my LLC that also owns a hotel. Or I probably wouldn't have the single family residentials in a town and then also own eight or 10 other single family residentials scattered throughout the country. I, I don't know, maybe I would, but it just depends on what I think that risk is. What, what is my likelihood of having to deal with a lawsuit or, or having a lawsuit or a claim attached to all the properties, right? That's another thing to think of. Um, so the other thing that I, and along those lines is that I consider is I'm not saying you should, guys should go out and do this, but I want to avoid accounting fees because they're, they're really not necessary. I don't need accounting fees. I don't need to file tax returns on an LLC that just holds title to my property. If I'm going to file tax returns for that, well, fine. I'm going to send that money to a company that files tax returns. So what? I don't need to have a tax return for every piece of land. The company is for managing risk. Taxes are not really the biggest risk you're dealing with. It's third party claims, really. All right, so what you could do is use the name of an LLC that is not registered, that does not have an EIN, that does not file a tax return. It doesn't need accounting except for the money it's generating would go to a central payment processor, okay, to handle that. And then you could do your accounting there. You don't need to have individual accounting for every different investment or every different asset. That would be like doing that same thing for a stock. That doesn't make any really, it doesn't, it's not really practical. So here's how you do it. You would designate the name of an LLC for each property. And you would use the address of the property as the name of the LLC. For example, the first property would be 1123 Elm Street. So the LLC title holder that I would put on the quit claim deed would be 1123 Elm Street, LLC. It has no tax number. It's not registered. I didn't even write up documents for it. It's just a name. 
Now that doesn't mean it doesn't exist and that doesn't mean it's not valid. It just means I didn't register it yet. No one's gonna challenge me, but if someone did, I can easily produce documents for it. We can do that in five minutes, okay? So you want to consider the idea that all you really need is the name of a title holder. And if you manage the risk properly, you don't need to register a company for every, every asset in your portfolio. Every like asset, put it that way. Every asset that has similar risks and similar you know, benefits. You can, you can just do it that way, have a naming scheme. All right, so that, enough of that. Um, now let's get into the idea. Okay, let me give you, actually, we're gonna talk about taking profits. I know everybody wants to talk about that because what, what good is all this uh, you know, paperwork and understanding if we don't, we're not gonna take profits and, and get the good part. That's the good part. But let's talk about some examples. So let's say, I'll give you a real life example. Um, someone came to me last year and uh, he had set up a company through me and he, has he was working with an attorney on something else. And really his attorney was um, helping him write up a contract uh, uh, to sell his half ownership of his C Corp to his partner. His partner was buying him out. And his attorney swore that there was no way to avoid capital gains taxes. So he calls me up and, and we had this conversation. And I said, well, send me the C Corp charter. Let me see what the rules are for owning the stock. And, and it was what I wanted to show him that I wasn't the one saying this because I was betting that it was already in the documents because most of the standard documents have this in there. So there was a page and a half of rules about how to own the stock and what liabilities you have for owning the stock, et cetera, et cetera, really complicated stuff. And then the very last line on the second page, it said, if the conveyance of the stock is for estate planning purposes, disregard the foregoing conditions. So that doesn't sound like much, does it? So I told him, look at the last line of the conditions for owning the stock in your company. It says you can convey the stock for estate planning purposes without any restrictions. So why would you do that? Well, if you sold the stock right now, your attorney's completely right. You have capital gains taxes. Why? Because you're a taxpayer. But let's create an innocent party and let's defer the taxes for this, at least this transaction. So let's set up a limited liability company in which you retain the beneficial interests and then we convey the stock title, the stock ownership through a stock transfer agreement for estate planning purposes to your limited liability company. So the beneficial interest of the 50% in the C-Corp were unchanged, but the title of the ownership was changed. So it went from John Smith to John Smith LLC, for example. I'm not saying you should title it that way, but it just moved to the LLC. So then I wrote up the contract for a stock transfer that was done for estate planning purposes. And he sent it to his attorney. And then the next day, the attorney writes back by email and says, oh, great. Yeah, this will work. Thanks. So after all that, you know, proclaiming there's no way to avoid it. If you just change your property rights and the way you use property, you can avoid certain liabilities. Then the question is, what do you do with all that cash, right? Now you got that cash. Here's your big risk. You didn't think it through. You avoided the tax liability, now what? You got a million dollars, it was over a million dollars. You better have an asset allocation plan, which just leads me into what we're gonna talk about very soon here, I'll get to that. So what I just described on the stock transfer, we can do for real estate. Now in California, for example, in California, if I do a quit claim deed from my real estate that I have in my name and I move it to a limited liability company, I don't have the what's called the documentary stamp tax on the value of the property. I have a filing fee. The filing fee is like probably $20, okay, to record this quick claim deed. I wanna record this deed to change the title holding, the title ownership, so that when it sells, the seller is not me, it's my company. So if I retain beneficial interest, I get the best of both worlds. I can avoid getting the 1099 from the title company, from the closing agent, having the legitimate tax liability, and I can, I can uh, move it over to the company and the company will get a 1099, in which case I can choose my tax treatment then. It could be deferred or it could be whatever I want it to be. Now, in California, you can find this. In fact, I have a video in the membership area, but basically <clears throat> there's a checkbox form that identifies when the transfer is done for, it actually says this in the form, for estate planning purposes, right? So what the government recognizes is that it's not going to charge you a tax for something 
that a conveyance of property that does not constitute a disposition of assets. So there's actually a form the county will give you um, and then you check the boxes and sign it and then you file that with your quit claim deed and your $20 fee and you don't have to pay this huge thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on a real estate transfer in California or most other states that do this, like Florida does it too, as long as the beneficial interests remain the same. And they can see the whole transaction, only the title changes. So that way, when you sell the property, like you can do this if you have a sale date, you can do this if you have a closing date, right before the closing date, you record a quick claim deed, you're exempt from the conveyance tax because it's for estate planning purposes, beneficial interests don't change. The 1099 and all the money, 100% goes to your LLC. Now you have a choice. You can just decide what to do. You don't pay capital gains tax on that transaction. That's for real estate. I do the same thing for an S corp. I come into a business, I see all the receivables. Maybe there's some liability, they're getting sued, IRS, whatever the thing is. I set up a new company, I change the merchant account, I change the way the account holder is recorded. I do a new W9, which gives the merchant processor the obligation to acknowledge and use the new company I set up with its new EIM. Same name or not, it doesn't matter. I can even make it in the same name. That way the company that had the existing liability that came from who knows where and who cares, no longer has a liability because why? Because it doesn't have the income anymore. The income's over here and now the business owner can decide how he wants to pay off his expenses or whatever. And then the liability is against that company that doesn't even need a bank account anymore. It does not even need a bank account. It's a corporation that operates, has employees and everything else. It does not even need a bank account. Why? Because it's got a third party payment processor that handles everything. It's kind of like your homeowners association that has a servicing company. A lot of HOAs don't even have bank accounts. You should check, you'll, you'll be interested to see that. Same thing with um, a list of real estate investments like I just told you. I mean, so these are ex different examples of, of how I've used them. So you can use the name of an LLC to hold title to lots of different properties. So I like to use the property address as the company name. And that way it makes them all separate. So when I do my quick claim deed, it works that way. Um, if I just want to do a deed now, let's say I have property in my name and I want to, you like what you're hearing and you want to go, you want to do a quick claim deed. It's that simple. The way you acquired the title is the way you convey the title. So when you bought the property, the, uh, the seller signed a quick claim deed. He quit his claim on the title and gave it to you. Now you were the grantor. Now when you convey it to something else, you become the grantee, right? So all you do is put a new name in as the grantee beside yourself, you name yourself as the grantor in the quit claim deed, and then you record it. The thing that owns the property can just be an LLC. Again, it doesn't have to be recorded. Sometimes it does. Um, if I take on an investor or a partner or something, I'm probably gonna record it. Depends on my partner though. Um, so that's, that's something you can decide on the fly. Now, how do we take profits? I know we cannot spend enough time on this. You guys want to hear more videos, more information on this, but let me just tell you generally. Here's how I like to take profits. If I have, let's use, I like cryptographic currency as an example. So let's say I have lots of money now in cryptographic coins. I just made a bunch of money. It's time to take some profits and I got to sell for dollars. But do I? How do I do that? What am I going to do with my profit in coins? I want to reallocate somewhere. And I always use the example of real estate. So it doesn't have to be real estate. It could be anything. But let's say I want to buy a hotel for $10 million. So I take $10 million worth of Bitcoin. But I don't need to sell my Bitcoin in my name. I don't need an LLC, ironically, to sell my Bitcoin. I can do that. I can use Coinbase. I can use Caleb and Brown. I can use some agent where I can sell and the account holder is the LLC, yes. Or I can take my Bitcoin and put it into escrow. So I make an offer on some real estate for $10 million. Offer is accepted. Now we have a closing date. I open escrow and let's say I'm gonna pay cash, which is not recommended, but I put $10 million of Bitcoin now, not dollars into escrow. It's under the escrow contract. My private keys are now owned by the escrow agent. That's the definition of escrow, it's a third party. I'm talking about qualified escrow, not your Uncle Bob. This is where both parties agree that it's a neutral third party that's gonna hold the property. So then the neutral third party has the, has the coins. Now, 
we have a service that'll liquidate those coins if your agent can't. But basically, and I think pretty soon your agent will be able to do this more and more. But if you can't, let me know because we have we have the ability to do this. We can buy the coins from your agent and your agent can sell the coins for dollars under escrow, which creates no tax liability for anybody. Oh, say that one again. I'm gonna sell $10 million with a Bitcoin for dollars and nobody's gonna owe taxes on that. Why? Because I'm using qualified escrow. I'm using a third party neutral escrow that has no interest in the transaction. All he's gonna get are fees out of it. Pretty slick. So now I've got $10 million in cash. If everything else goes well, the banks don't interfere. And it's an escrow in the escrow agent's bank account. And I'm two weeks from now, I'm gonna close. Now, the seller's gonna have a tax liability unless he figured out how to deal with that. The escrow agent's gonna pay the seller, gonna pay the closing costs, everything's gonna be settled. And I'm gonna take the title to the hotel. Now, it doesn't matter who owned the Bitcoin. So we don't have to talk about that. What matters is who takes title to that property. Now, everybody knows real estate in the States is gonna be denominated in US dollar. You're not gonna get away with saying, well, I bought the uh, hotel in Bitcoin and it's priced in Bitcoin, therefore it, it's not dollars. The IRS is not gonna to agree to that, even though they probably should. But when you use escrow in this way and you acquire the title to real estate and you put it in your name, you've taken a gain. And if you individually put it in your name, that's just $10 million of taxable income, reportable income. So just realize that. But if you take the title in a company, then all you've done is take an asset where you had no tax liability and you moved it to, let's call it another organization or asset to acquire a different kind of asset with it. You've moved one asset to into another type of asset, one property into another type of property. Along the way, you never created a tax liability or a gain or a disposition of assets. Just make sure that you don't title that property in your name. Make sure that it's, again, in a separate limited liability company. And in that case, with a $10 million hotel, I would register a limited liability company. You can do it the day before. And I would title it in that name. And there's a big reason for that. Because $10 million cash into a big asset like that is a problem for a long time. It, if you let it go for a long time like that. So you can successfully avoid the taxes legally and everything like that. But if you have that kind of capital into an asset like that, you really need to get financing or a partner or something. You need to offset that risk of having all your cash tied up there and let someone else take on that risk. Um, the other reason is if you buy a hotel, okay, that's a real estate investment. It's also a business. In fact, it's probably a collection of businesses. You got a bar, you got a restaurant in there, probably you got all kinds of stuff going on, vending machines, whatever, uh, third party services. You're also by default your own lender. If you pay cash for an asset, you are by default your own lender. So are you suited to be a lender? Do you understand the underwriting? Do you have a third party to, to um, borrow from to offset your loan risk? Because when you lend money as a bank, you wanna borrow money from another institution that's set to take on the risk of that loan to offset its own risk. You're not ready to do that. I mean, most people are not. So if you don't, have the underwriting and all these risk assessment ability to lend money to to the, for the purchase of an asset like this and you paid cash for the asset well you're by default you are that lender so i would just say get out of that situation as quickly as you can so try to get some type of loan like hard money 50 percent on the equity something some bank loan um, hopefully you can get the loan on the balance sheet of the asset that you just bought for 10 million dollars you would think you should be able to do that so that's something else to think about again I'm just explaining how to take profits. And yes, the tax situation is easy to avoid. And then you can see the big risk is having all that cash into one asset and you're taking on other kinds of risks that you really didn't think about. So that's where we start getting into really risk management, okay? And you don't care about taxes when you start getting to that world. So taking title, in a company name will avoid that $10 million turning into a tax liability among other things. If you wanna put something in your name, let's say you wanna buy a new house. So you take $3 million or a million dollars or whatever, and you buy a new house. Again, don't take the title in your name. For that, you can use escrow all over again, or you can sell your coins into your LLC account at the exchange. And then you can wire the money from your LLC account to the, um, the title company or the closing agent, whoever is doing the deal, the escrow company. 
And you can either take title in a company name, a trust name, or whatever you want to do, or you can structure it as a loan. So the way you would do that is if, if you bought a house, you can take the title, put it in your name. Let's say it's in Florida and you're going to live there. So you want to put it in your name because you're going to get good tax benefits. Well, you want to, within 30 days, record a mortgage on the property. So that way it's a loan and you still want to write the terms of the mortgage. You get to make this paper up. You can write this, these documents. You record the mortgage in your county within 30 days. And I'm just saying 30 days. It could probably be 90 days. I'm just saying you should do it in a, in a, in a brief amount of time. Make the interest rate reasonable and then actually have a way to document payments. Now, I'm not saying you actually have to go to the trouble of making payments. Some people do, but you can also have an accounting sheet that shows that you made those payments if someone ever asks, if the IRS ever asks, and you can make it a real loan. So let's say you bought some property uh, and then you put it in your name and you go to Sally Mae's website and you download a standard mortgage form and a note, promissory note, and you write up all those documents and you go on the internet and you do an amortization for 30 years and you record, you get the payments in there and you get a real interest rate and you do all the calculations, you record a valid real mortgage with a note. You don't record the note, you keep the note so that it's negotiable, okay? So it's a real paper. It's an obligation that you can actually sell. People will actually pay for it. Uh, that means it's valid. It's not a fake mortgage. So once that's all done, um, you can you can have the best of both worlds, so to speak. You just have to have, have a way to document that it's a real loan. And then the other way is if you're going to pay off a mortgage, same idea. I don't think you should do this, but if you pay off a mortgage, yeah, okay, so you tie up all your cash into a liability. You pay off a mortgage in a house that you live in, you're, you're putting a lot of cash into a liability. So now you have a house that you live in with no debt. You might sleep better at night, but it is really a poor use of capital. So what I'd recommend is, like I mentioned in part one, is acquire an asset, get some cash flow, do a set off, and let that cook, okay? Let's say I want to buy, but going back to the idea of a legitimate loan, let's say I want to buy a piece of real estate for which my reported income cannot be justified. Like if I were to pay them, make the real mortgage payments on this piece of property that I want to live in, it would be, let's say my whole income. Well, that's not going to survive. If I get audited, the IRS is going to say, well, that's not a real transaction. So here's what I will do. I'll write the mortgage with a 30 year amortization rate. And then I will make a balloon payment in three years, or I will, I will take the mortgage payments and I'll cut them in half on the contract. I'll write that into the contract so that my $4,000 a month payments that are amortized for 30 years are only $2,000 a month for the first 36 months. And then after that, those the other half payments are added on to either the back end or they're factored into the other payments or I have to refinance with a balloon or something like that, right? So then I literally can can buy whatever I want if I write the contract that way. And then as we approach the three years, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to refinance, right? I'm going to file a satisfaction of mortgage and I'm going to record another lien. It's going to do it all over again. So you really don't have a lot of limit. Just keep it real. Be practical. Don't be afraid of taxes and just be practical. Okay. Really is what we're talking about. Now there's something else that's kind of a little more sophisticated. We could talk about all kinds of ways to structure this. I just want to give you a basic understanding of how we can use this LLC. The last one is called the infinite banking concept. I know some of you are familiar with this. Um, I have an agent that I work with in uh, Texas. Basically, what they're able to do is you take cash and before you pay for something, you would fund a policy, a whole life policy. Now, it does take some time to mature, uh, but, but you, can, you can have an, a whole life insurance policy where there's an insurable interest and you can probably come up with 200 different insurable interests. I mean, we can, we can write contracts for all kinds of things. So let's say I wanted to buy something that was $3 million or let's say I wanted to um, pay my living expenses that are $100,000 a year and I don't wanna call that my income I want to make it look like I had a huge windfall, paid all my taxes, and I don't need to have any taxes for like the next 20 years, right? So the way I do that is I would use loan money to pay my annual living expenses. And the way I would do it is I would just buy a whole life policy. Let's say I insure myself and my wife as a beneficiary. Pretty simple. And then I can own the policy or my company can own the policy. You'll figure that out um, based on what you need to do. And I can fund the policy. And then 
after about a year or two when it matures, I can borrow out quarterly or I can borrow out for the whole year, like I can borrow $100,000. And then if I don't want to deal with it anymore, if I want to use after tax money, I would just simply pay the interest, the total interest on that contract, on the loan contract to the insurance company. Then I, I would be working with after tax money. So now all that money I'm using to go on vacation and buy the toaster oven, like we talk about, or buy a car or whatever, all that's after tax money. And the IRS sees it as um, after tax money that's borrowed as long as it's a legitimate loan, which it is. And when I pay that loan back to my insurance contract, I'm actually making money on it when I do that. So if I use a whole life policy to pay living expenses and I follow the contract, I'm actually gonna come out ahead. I'm actually creating like a savings account, if, I, if you wanna say it that way, uh, in the, at the end of the year. Now, if you take that concept a little bit further, and let's say I have a business and I have competitors on the street where my business operates, and I wanna be more competitive, but we're both good business managers. Let's say it's a restaurant. I'm a restaurant, he's a restaurant, and we're doing pretty good, but our margins are about the same because we're in a certain market where we understand it well enough, we've dialed into where we can make so much profit, but we really can't easily do much better until we start firing people, and then we have uh, bad customer service, right? So we're at that point. So how do I lower my operating costs? Well, before I pay my operating costs on a quarterly or whatever, I will set up a whole life policy to fund that policy. And then before I pay my operating costs or put the money aside to pay them, I will borrow that money from my policy. So I'll pay the policy first when it matures, borrow the money out, pay my business operating costs. And what's going to happen is over time, my, my margin, if it's, if it's one, if I have $1 left over to work with, as I borrow the money and I'm making money, I'm accruing interest in doing this, my operating costs, my, let's, say, let's say it this way, my profit was, is gonna go up like this. So now my profit is not one, 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 it's two, two, two. And my competitor's profit is still one, one, one. And I'm making more money than him doing the same thing just simply because of the way I'm spending my money. So that's another strategy to manage risk. Again, there's ways to manage risk. And do we care about taxes? Yeah, kind of, but I'm not going to go out of my way to get a tax exemption or a, some sort of avoiding taxes. I'm just going to focus on the best use of capital uh, and managing risk. All right, so that's what my focus is. I think this covers everything. I'm sure you're going to have more questions than I covered in parts one and two please schedule time with me. Um, you, you're welcome to do the free 20 minute consultation. That's fine. Um, if we go over, that's fine too. Um, but uh, thanks for, thanks for listening. Have a good day.